<laughs> so I have been talking about Cypher recently and I would like to continue with that today um, talking about uh, the details of how Cypher patterns work. So how do we actually express patterns in that query language um, and how do we um, uh, then match them and what kind of results can we expect and how does all of this compare to Sparkle. Um, so welcome back to the Knowledge Graphs video series. My name is Markus Krutsch and we are in the middle of treating property graphs and there are <clears throat> one of their many query languages, Cypher, for, for lack of a fully standardized um, query language uh, to teach. Um, this is maybe at least a good example of how some query languages work. <clears throat> so um, reviewing this, of course, you remember what property graphs looked like. We have a graph model which is directed like we have in basically any knowledge graph. Um, but the main difference in this case is that um, the graph now supports these annotations here. These are secondary pieces of information that you can attach to any node and to any edge and um, that uh, are in a certain sense subsidiary to the main data. Yes, So these uh, pieces of information are inside uh, these yellow boxes here as I have drawn them and they are they are there you can query them but they are not on the same level as the rest of the graph and um, for many systems that implement this model uh, working with these um, second grade pieces of information is um, different in practice and also in in principle in the capabilities that you get with the query language but also in practical performance that you get when you use these so um, a typical guideline would be that um, retrieving this kind of information um, fetching this extra information from a node is is fast and efficient but doing joins across it um, analyzing data based on which kind of uh, annotations it has on this level can be um, slower than what you would expect maybe if you know an RDF database and are used to um, just using all the data in uh, analytical queries alike. Um, okay, so um, this is the graph model and um, Cypher now as a query language is um, relatively simple it's uh, it has a lot of uh, similarities to sparkle in that it is a query language where you mainly specify the patterns that you are looking for so you are describing what kind of patterns in the graph you would like to see and um, <coughs> the um, syntax for this is a bit different as we have seen and we will detail in this uh, video but the concepts are still very similar you describe a little graph inside your query and uh, ask the system to find instances of this little graph inside your database. There's something here which is a filter that we will discuss in a later video and you have a return statement rather than a select but besides these syntactic uh, differences the conceptual um, underlying ideas are quite uh, similar to what you've seen in Sparkle. <coughs> And I think in many places, um, both differ more from SQL than they differ from each other, even though the syntax is, qu is quite uh, different. Um, but there are also some things in which Cypher is special and differs also um, both from Sparkle and from SQL, as I will show you. Now, um, let's talk a bit more generally about how Sp Cypher actually looks. So far, I've only given you examples and showed you many uh, queries that you can express. So you have a bit of a feeling of how this might look, but we haven't really discussed it in general. So um, what this slide shows you is a long list of possible building blocks of pieces that you could have in such a query. And these pieces in Cypher are called clauses. That's the term for such a piece and you can in general have many of them. So these are not just like the main blocks in a Sparkle or SQL query where you have one select and one where and so on. But uh, these are more uh, almost like instructions in a programming language. These clauses can um, be uh, listed and you can have a long list of such clauses until you finally um, return something. <coughs> we have already seen match clauses, the ones where you give the pattern, where clauses, um, which are used to give extra filter expressions. I will come to that later on. With clauses, uh, we will discuss they are relevant for doing subqueries. Um, return is what used to be select, 
in the other query languages. And then there's also the typical modifiers that you know from other languages, order by limit, um, skip is uh, Cypher's name for offset, um, uh, but it has the same uh, uh, use and uh, can be uh, applied in the same simple fashion. And then there's also some unions, um, not, not quite as general as in Sparkle, but you can do um, feasible unions with them. <coughs> okay, so um, as I said, these clauses are chained, uh, so this is not nested, but uh, it's more like a processing pipeline. But uh, this does not necessarily mean that the uh, clauses have to be processed exactly in that order by a well-optimized um, cipher processing system if there is such a thing it could actually uh, try to answer the query in a different way than by uh, going clause by clause <clears throat> and i think at least to some extent uh, especially with where this is uh, certainly done in uh, current systems because it would not be feasible at all to to just go from top to bottom um, <clears throat> In general, the main block structure in this list of uh, um, queries uh, or query clauses is of the form match where with. Yeah? Match gives you a pattern where filters the results down to something and with returns um, results to the next part of your query. This is how this works. Um, <clears throat> okay, now um, in this video, first of all, I would like to formally or a bit more comprehensively, let's say, define how exactly the uh, node patterns in Cypher are created. Um, you have seen quite a few examples so far. Node patterns are the patterns that we use to describe some node in the graph. And this was usually written in parentheses. And um, often these parentheses contained additional optional uh, pieces. A variable name can be there, which is simply a string. You can have a list of labels. Um, this is again uh, strings, but prefixed by the colon. Um, this, uh, as you remember, I hope uh, in the property graph model is a is a kind of special type of attribute that you can assign to nodes. Um, <clears throat> uh, a bit similar to a type or a class, maybe an RDF, in the sense that you can put uh, oh, a, a certain type of tag to your nodes and filter by this. And this is more efficient than usually than filtering by uh, the uh, actual properties in the yellow boxes. And then there have, you have the properties, of course, that they can also occur inside the uh, pattern for a node if you want to have only nodes with certain properties. Um, and this is then written in braces um, with a comma separated list of key value pairs inside. Okay. Um, <clears throat> most of this. Uh, is, uh, takes the form of strings um, and the main quotation mechanism used by Cypher here are backticks, uh, special uh, kinds of uh, symbols, not to be confused by with straight quotes. Both are on many keyboard layouts, I think. May, if, I'm not sure if they are on all directly. Um, so backticks are used to uh, quote names of variables, names of property keys, and so on. Um, values, on the other hand, are strings that uh, are written in straight quotes. So if you have strings, uh, you need to put the straight quotes. So you have two different quotation symbols. Uh, don't ask me why this was preferred, but this is how it is. OK, so let's see an example of how this looks. So <clears throat> simplest possible node pattern is just this just denotes an arbitrary node. We could say a blank node in, in Sparkle, uh, in a Sparkle query would be similar. It's a node which you cannot select, you cannot return it in any way, you have no conditions other than that it exists. Um, <clears throat> second example here, um, the node pattern starts he here and ends here. It starts with a V, this is a variable name that you would return or use in another clause if you want to work with it. And um, then you have here in braces several properties that you require, namely that the name is uh, Melita Benz. Here you see the quotes around the string and that the year of birth, here you see the back ticks around the label that has spaces in it, the property. Um, this should have the value uh, 1873, which um, in this case might be a, an integer number. Okay. <clears throat> And then you could also do things like this, uh, where you have two labels, 
inside the node, requiring that both of them are present. Okay, so this is how node patterns work. And as opposed to Sparkle, where a single node did not carry information, it was just, it had an identifier, maybe it could have an URI and you could filter this a bit. Um, so uh, there would be some conditions you could express with the help of filters on a single node. But um, most of the time, everything in Sparkle or in RDF, which is really of interest, is encoded in triples. So Sparkle actually doesn't even have the ability to query for nodes. So you can't just say, give me all the nodes and then impose some conditions in, on them. You have to have an edge in your query pattern. This is not uh, the case in um, Cypher. There you can have nodes on their own. And this makes sense because Property Graph moves uh, a lot of the interesting information into the nodes as this second grade information in the properties. And uh, in order to access this, uh, you need to have um, some kind of method, right? Okay. Now, let me go out of the way here. So um, with nodes defined, you can now also define paths. And um, paths you have also seen, um, they um, are written by combining one or more node patterns uh, where two nodes in each case are linked by relationship patterns, which look like this, uh, if they are forward edges or this, if they are backward edges or this without any arrow tip, if they are bidirectional. And um, inside the brackets, you can write many different things. There's a pattern that defines what kind of relationships you want to have between the nodes that you are connecting by one of these three things. Um, they could again have a variable name inside, like the nodes, if you want to match the actual edge. Um, <coughs> this is something that, of course, you can also do in Sparkle. You can have um, variables for properties or for predicates, I should say, in triples, um, which allows you to find out what kind of relationship connects two nodes in the graph. And here you too, you can have variables for the relationships. Um, you can also have a list of relationship types. This is different from the list of node labels. I mean, technically, both the node labels and the relationship types in the property graph model are labels. One is put to the nodes, one is put to the edges. But uh, a relationship type is always unique. There can only be one type of relationship. And in, this is why here you have, uh, it doesn't make sense to require that two different types are present because every edge can only have one. So what you write here is a colon to indicate that you're talking about types and then you can have a pipe separated list of strings, um, which indicates that you are interested in one of those labels to be present. So this is a disjunction instead of a conjunction as opposed to the situation with uh, node labels, where you have always a conjunction and never a disjunction. So you can also see that the, the, the kind of features that you have and what you can do and cannot do are not quite uniform uh, across these things. Then you have a range literal. This can be a star. This would be the Claney star that this indicates that a longer path is allowed, similar to the path expressions we have seen in Sparkle. But here you can also have an number range if you want to indicate that the path has to be in a certain length range uh, which is something you couldn't very easily express in sparkle and then uh, again like for the properties you could have a set uh, of oh, sorry like for the nodes i wanted to say you can have a set of properties which is again put into braces as a comma separated key value pair list okay <clears throat> So all of these can be present inside each of the um, relationship patterns that connect two node patterns in one of those arrows that you can write here. Okay, here's an example um, that uses all of these features in one way or the other. Um, let's just look at the query and I will, uh, or it's a pattern and I will explain. So you will you see here three node patterns, A, B, and um, the unlabeled one over here. And um, A and B, of course, would be variable uh, names used for these node patterns. And for us, mainly, they are convenient to talk about these things. So um, we require that between A and B, there is a connection of relationships, of, of edges in the graph. <coughs> and this uh, uh, 
connection of relationships should have relationship types E or F. One of the two. That's the type, uh, the second uh, item in this list here. And then you have a range from 5 to 10, meaning that you require that the, the distance from A to B is between 5 and 10. So there should be multiple edges of, this, uh, of one of this type. And uh, the multiplicity is uh, restricted by these numbers. Then, on the other hand, from the other node to B, you also require the existence of a relationship, but in this case, it doesn't have a range, so it's just a single relationship. You give it the variable name E to access it later or to um, use it in different patterns, and it should have a property called score with value 0 0.8. Okay, <clears throat> so this is... Um, a lot of features, but uh, this is a natural thing that, of course, the syntax somewhat proliferates here uh, because we have now this two-level data model. Yeah, so in, in RDF, everything was on one level. You had a very simplified, very normalized data model which only knew one kind of structure, and of course, this means that also the patterns are relatively simple because there's only this one kind of expression that you need to uh, capture. Here, you have now several levels and. Um, in addition to the several levels, you have different types of labels for nodes and for edges. And for all of these, you need a different syntax to somehow work with it. Um, uh, I think it's a matter of taste whether you like more this heavyweight model of the property graph or more the reduced uh, uh, simplified model of the RDF graph. Um, for somebody who has to implement a database management system, a heavyweight model has some advantages because it uh, gives different categories to the features. It says some things are the properties, some things are the labels, some things are the relationships that connect things. And um, of course, it's maybe not clear upfront which one will be used in which way by the user or what the user wants to do with it. But um, you could use these different ways to, of storing the basically the same information um, as hints for your optimizer. You could say if some if a user puts something into the property set, maybe it's not used for joins. Now you don't have to have an index on it. If a user makes something into a relation, you should have some kind of efficient um, navigation facility, some index structures that allow you to move back and forward because there's likeliness that somebody wants to follow paths along these structures. So <clears throat> this can um, be helpful for an implementer. I think for a user it's not so particularly helpful. Uh, it can also um, be nice if you're used to it, but it can similarly be nice if you if you have uh, the flexibility of a model where everything can play every role. Um, I, I think there's no clear case here, but if you want to, to, uh, to, to have an, uh, a simpler way of implementing things, it um, can be, I think, an advantage to uh, make people uh, decide what kind of information each of the pieces of their knowledge actually is. Is it a label? Is it a, is it a property? Is it a relationship? Okay. So now let's look a bit more on uh, at these features. I think many of these you have already uh, understood from my description. Here is another relatively text-heavy slide, um, which sums up much of the things that I've already said. So um, <clears throat> the various features of path patterns express the following query conditions. So these are basically uh, the explanations of what is actually meant by the syntactic things that I've just shown you. So um, in general, sequences of these stylized arrows that I've shown you between the node patterns express linear subgraphs. So they are uh, paths that have edges in some direction, backward, forwards, or both. And, uh, but they have to be linear because if you write them as a list of node patterns, um, you cannot have uh, uh, forks where the graph has, uh, continues into different directions. Um, the arrow tips indicate which directions you're interested in. Um, the pipe is disjunction, as I explained. Um, the uh, same property map syntax is used as in the node patterns. Uh, so this should be pretty intuitive. And the star indicates a range uh, for uh, repetitions of a certain thing. Um, <clears throat> an important thing I would like to note at this point already is that the star always applies to the complete relationship pattern. So if you look at this description here again, there is no um, 
structural uh, positioning of where the star actually goes. The star is either there or not, but it, it, there is no option of where to put it. Sparkle was very different in that respect. In Sparkle, you could have uh, the star inside a parenthesis or outside, and you could have several things that you then combine and put a star around. Um, you could even have nested star expressions, uh, like in regular expressions in general. But uh, here, this is not possible. Here, the star just indicates that the whole pattern that you have uh, can or has to repeat, depending on your, your ranges. And uh, uh, this is always the outermost thing that happens. So you cannot have a star inside uh, this pattern in some way and iterate over this. Um, I'm not sure if this is a big limitation in practice uh, or not. As I think our <coughs> most of the um, queries I have seen for in Sparkle, also queries that I have seen from um, real-world Sparkle data sets, um, do use this star as the outermost feature. So uh, there is not necessarily a big problem in, in just having this available. <coughs> But it still uh, allows us to see a certain difference to Sparkle and to the expressivity that you know from Sparkle. So um, in contrast to Sparkle, Cypher does not support arbitrary regular expressions. But it can still capture certain regular languages with this syntax, but not all of them. So for example, if you have the Sparkle property path pattern, which looks like this, P or the converse of P or the reverse of P, uh, Q or the reverse of Q it should be, it's, <laughs> I reversed the letter here too, so this is looking like a P, but it should be a Q, um, and a star around it. This is a star pattern put around a disjunction of things which are forward and backward directed. So you uh, have a nesting or a certain regular expression, which is not completely simple, but it can easily be expressed in cipher by putting the, uh, by writing something like this. Yeah. So A and B are now the node variables. They are written like this. So instead of the question mark, you have to put the parentheses. And uh, the connection here is P or Q would be your relationship type. And you have both directions indicated by not having uh, any arrow tip. And you have a star, meaning that this can occur many times. And you see that this, this takes maybe some getting used to because the star is inside the bracket, but it applies to the structure, the syntactic structure, including the stuff outside the bracket. Yeah. So the fact that there's no arrow tip here is actually significantly part of what the star applies to, even though the star is, is innermost. Yeah. Okay. But this is just how it is. You can also see that um, this works nicely if I want P and Q both in both ways. If I only wanted P in the converse direction and Q in only one direction, I would have a problem, right? Because I cannot, I cannot have the directionality for P o for Q only and for P not. Also, uh, this kind of freedom I, I don't have here in, in a direct way. Um, <clears throat> There's many, many other uh, expressions that you cannot express with Cypher. For example, this is one um, P followed by Q, an arbitrary number of times. Um, like, as I said, we don't see such patterns very often in practice, but this um, may uh, be a, an artifact of current usage, and I'm not sure that this is something that will always stay like this. So the reason why we see star patterns at all is that they are used to navigate um, hierarchies in particular, or um, hierarchies that may sometimes have cycles or that may, may, may be uh, just uh, a certain certain graphs of, of uh, low depth, but are mostly like hierarchies. So if you have a taxonomy or a class hierarchy, these kind of things are <coughs> um, often using stars. And of course, this is just one kind of property and you use the star directly on top of it. Um, why would you use such a pattern where two things follow uh, uh, each other and then the star is used? Um, well, for example, if you would have, the, the, you remember how in Wikidata the complex data model was encoded. So we there said in order to store all these extra pieces of information that you have around about the uh, relationships between um, two uh, entities, you um, basically the, the yellow boxes, yeah, the properties that you have in property graph. In order to store this, we would have an intermediate node 
for the relationship as such. And this node would have all the pieces of information and you would get from the first entity, you would first go to the intermediate node and then from there with another property to the actual target value. And uh, so you, there you have a, a path of length two. And um, if you wanted to then combine uh, uh, this with uh, several iterations to navigate such a um, uh, relationships consisting of such length two paths then you would need to have exactly this pattern the reason that we don't see this in wikidata very much is that wikidata always introduces a shortcut for the main um, kind of uh, use case namely that you want to go from the entity to its to the uh, entity that is directly connected to uh, the original entity through this wikidata statement if you wanted to go through to another entity, which is maybe connected by a qualifier in uh, Wikidata, so by one of the um, annotations, what, what property graph would call properties, then you would uh, not be able to do that with one step and you would just use such a pattern. And in Sparkle, this would work. Um, in uh, Cypher, it, it cannot be done. Yeah? So there are some limitations here. And I think they are. it's, it's not completely... Uh, clear that nobody ever wants to do that and that's why you don't need it. I think there are definitely some use cases for it, even if it's not the majority. And then <clears throat> there's also cases where um, it's not easy to express something with Cypher, but it's still somehow possible. So for example, if you have this pattern here, P or um, the reverse of Q and this uh, iterated, this cannot be expressed like the first case here. Um, but because in one case you want to go forwards, in the other case backwards. But it is possible to uh, use other Cypher features to express that. Essentially, you would have to match a larger class of paths and then you could um, actually um, filter for the cases where the expected um, uh, properties forward and backward are in uh, this path. But this is more work and it's uh, potentially very slow too. I mean, uh, but it's so what I mean uh, to say here is that just because something cannot be directly said in the um, syntax we have for relation uh, uh, patterns here does not mean necessarily that it's impossible to have a cipher query with other features that indirectly captures this. So that's also sometimes possible. But I think for this one, I don't see how this could be done only with, with a lot, lot of extra processing in Cypher. Okay, <clears throat> so this is node patterns and uh, relationship patterns um, combined. Or, uh, and uh, from this, we can now build graph patterns. Um, they are just a um, comma-separated list of path patterns. So <clears throat> path patterns, uh, uh, the linear subgraph matches that we just described and then graph patterns if you combine several path patterns with a comma. Um, so this is, if you hear this, this is very similar to the basic graph patterns in Sparkle. Yeah? So there we also had um, several uh, simple patterns. In this case, they couldn't be very long. Also with Sparkle, of course, you could also have multi-hop patterns by using these path expressions. And uh, everything beyond those very simple triple patterns or sparkle path patterns you had to do by um, doing joins by combining them into a bigger pattern uh, into a bgp and this is exactly what's happening here you have these uh, basic uh, simple graph patterns or path patterns i should say uh, in uh, cipher which are a bit more heavyweight because of the extra level of properties and uh, also more can already do quite a lot of things on their own but then you can uh, have a comma and and several of these to have a bigger pattern <clears throat> um, and uh, the combination of these is a join like uh, one where you uh, uh, match the variables across the um, nodes okay right so this seems all very similar and very familiar in the end with the exception of the uh, yeah, superficial syntactic differences and the, the two level um, data model However, we should, of course, ask, is that similarity uh, true? 
and or is that uh, maybe in some sense even treacherous is that not the exact same thing it just looks similar on the first glance and then you get different results and it turns actually out that the, the latter is uh, in a certain sense the case so i have talked to people who had tried to compare the performance of property graph and rdf databases and they designed benchmarks for that and they ran the benchmarks translated appropriately on several systems including Neo4j, including Blazecraft, maybe including other RDF uh, databases. And it turns out that Neo4j just returned different results than all the other systems all of the time. Um, so the surprise was not that the performance was different, that was also um, uh, notable, but uh, it was uh, the results were different, even though the queries seem to intuitively um, look very similar. Yeah. And um, <coughs> the, the reasons for this are some subtleties uh, in how um, property graph, how Cypher, I should say, specifically um, interprets patterns. Um, so um, let me explain that to you. So in general, many things of how, how graph patterns are evaluated are very much how we would expect them. So um, <coughs> the idea similar to what we have in Sparkle is that we are mapping parts of the pattern to the graph. So uh, finding a match means finding a mapping from the pattern to the graph. Every node pattern must be mapped to a node. Every path pattern must be mapped to a path. What is a path? It's an alternating sequence of nodes and relationships. So it's a list where every um, odd entry is a node and every even entry is a relationship. So it's, it's a list of certain heavyweight objects in a certain sense. This is a cipher style of working with data. You always have these um, programming like lists um, to work with things, but that's perfectly fine. Sparkle just doesn't have a way to represent paths. Otherwise it would also be some kind of list structure. <clears throat> okay, so path patterns are actually also mapped explicitly. Um, and uh, such a sequence uh, that we get there is a path and um, <clears throat> It is possible that different matches of the same pattern include paths of different lengths. For example, if you use a star in your uh, path pattern, then you allow for different lengths of paths to match this. And uh, so you could have uh, paths of different lengths in the, in the match. Um, this also somehow occurs in Sparkle, but in Sparkle, the path is not really part of the match. You cannot return the path. There's no way to show the path in Sparkle. In Cypher, this can be done, as I will show you um, next time. Um, uh, and importantly, each distinct path is a distinct match. That's also different from Sparkle. In Sparkle, even if you have path expressions, uh, there could be many paths matching the expression, but uh, Sparkle only indicates that there is one. Um, it's not counted. Huh? And well, similar as in Sparkle, uh, every part of the pattern must be matched, even if there's no variable to it. So just like uh, the case where you have B nodes in Sparkle, which are also not selected anywhere, but still they have to have a match in uh, the graph in order to uh, have an overall match for the query. So that's not surprising. Okay, so <clears throat> one difference here was the uh, count. Yeah? So distinct um, paths lead to distinct matches. Um, but there's another big difference, which is not on this slide yet. And this is the uh, first of the two special aspects that I highlight here. So, uh, and this I call unique edges. Um, in any match of a single graph pattern, each relationship must be used in only one place. Relationship is the property graph name for what is called an edge in, in graphs normally. So each edge must be used as a target for mapping a pattern to only once. But each node can be used many times. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that unlike most other database query languages, certainly all the query languages I, I, that come to my mind, SQL, Sparkle, Datalog, XPath even, um, Cypher matches do not correspond to homomorphisms. Huh? What is a homomorphism again? A homomorphism is structure preserving mapping, yes. And as I said, cipher match, ma uh, matches also are mappings. We match the pattern to the graph, but uh, 
it's not enough if they preserve the structure. So structure preserving just means that everything that you say about your pattern is also true about the things that you match to in the graph. Yeah? So if a node um, needs to have a certain label in your pattern and you map it to some node, it, this node that you map to also must have this label, maybe others, but at least this label must be there. And that's the only requirement that you have for most query languages, that everything you require to be there is there. Um, but uh, in uh, Cypher, we additionally have this uniqueness requirement, meaning that uh, if you require the presence of two relationships in your um, pattern, it's only possible to match them if the graph also has two different relationships that you can map them to. You are not allowed to use the same relationship many times. On the other hand, for nodes, there's no such restriction. You can use the same node many times. That might seem a bit strange and not clearly motivated. So why why is it okay to have the if you if you write a node in your pattern, why is it possible to have to interpret it in the same way as another node in your pattern? But then you write a relationship in your pattern, it's not allowed. Um, but the, the reason behind such, such restrictions is that Cypher wants to and, and cannot avoid to have a mechanism uh, that uh, limits the possible number of matches to be finite. Yeah. Why is that a problem? How could a match not be finite, right? I mean, uh, for, for Sparkle, this was clear. You have every, um, every variable is matched is mapped to one thing in the graph, one node or one property, which is RDF property, which is a predicate. Um, so it has a single value, which is given by a, a URI or a B node, something like this. Um, so this must be finite. But uh, as I said, with um, with Cypher, relationships, when they have um, ranges, can be mapped to paths of length greater than one. And these paths are different matches. So if you would allow the same relationship to occur several times, you could go in cycles to produce longer and longer paths, and thereby you would have infinitely many different paths, for example, from one node to another. Yeah. And so there must be, you must have some emergency break to event, prevent that. You could prevent that by saying nodes can be matched only once. You could prevent that by saying that relationships can be matched only once. You could also prevent that by some other ad hoc means maybe. But something needs to be done in order to uh, pre prevent repeating uh, um, uh, loops in a in a path, so to speak. Yeah. And so what Cypher did is uh, to require uniqueness of edges. That's uh, that's the whole motivation behind this. I don't think that from a practical point of view, an a practitioner would appreciate that over the other option. Um, I mean, yeah. It's, it can be good or bad either way. So there are queries where you want this difference to be there and you would have to manually assert it in uh, other query languages like SQL. Um, and there's also queries where you would like uh, two things to be allowed to be the same. And in this case, you may uh, need uh, to write it differently in, in Cypher, as I will show you in a second. Um, but in most cases, let's be honest, you won't see the difference. But if you run a large benchmark, you will. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing I already mentioned is path counting, which is, is in some sense the, the reason why we need this unique edge restriction or why we need something like this unique edge restriction, um, which means that uh, we can count how many paths exist between one node and another, which is, as you know, from the exercise classes of this course, uh, prohibitively expensive in even very small graphs to do. So um, it makes sense in some use cases to have that, but you have to be very careful with it because the numbers can get very large very fast even if you don't have repetitions. And this was why it was actually eliminated from the Sparkle standard. Yes, so there, it was originally planned to, that Sparkle would also count paths, but after some uh, research papers on the topic and some uh, discussions within the working group, this was uh, in the end not done um, for the sake of performance and implementability. Okay. Right. So this is the cipher matching semantics. Now, does that mean that the semantics is necessarily dis different and incomparable to that of Sparkle um, and all the other query engines that you see here? I mean, SQL and data log. Um, 
And this is an interesting question because uh, if you want to implement Cypher on top of one of these, yeah, you would also have to think about, can you actually do that? Um, but let's go the other way. Let's say um, if I want to have a behavior which I know from Sparkle and SQL, and I want to have that in Cypher too, what, is there a way to do it? And the answer is, is yes, there is a way. Um, the restrictions that each relationship can be used only once in a pattern is uh, enforced only within single patterns. So if you have one graph pattern, then for this graph patterns matches, the restriction will apply. But you can have several graph pa uh, uh, patterns and then the restriction does no longer apply. So um, here's an example of a rather construed query that requires a homomorphism semantics in the traditional sense of, of other query languages and um, how it is realized in Cypher. So you want to find all persons who have a daughter and uh, who moreover have a relation with a computer scientist uh, of some kind. So some kind of relation to a computer scientist should exist in the graph. And we would like to allow that this is the same person. So it might be that the daughter is the computer scientist and that the relationship is has daughter. It could, have, it could also be another um, type of relationship. So how would I do that? I just have to put it into two different graph patterns. So I have two match clauses here. I match person P with a has daughter relationship to an arbitrary node. So the person has a daughter. And secondly, I match person P with some unknown relationships that I describe as variable R or capture with variable R um, to some body who has a property occupation computer scientist. Okay, so this is uh, the requirement here and then I want to return the name of the person and uh, the type of the relationship and you see here are some expressive features that I haven't really introduced yet um, but which uh, I will show you in the next slide. <clears throat> okay so you see here this this will then be evaluated independently with the two uh, matches uh, each uh, using some mapping but uh, not checking what the other does and therefore then you can have the same relationship in both. Okay if you don't do that if you just put a comma remove the match then you would fail to find uh, the has daughter relationship to a computer scientist. So some spurious uh, results from your query might be missing. And as I said, it's um, it's relatively construed. Maybe you wouldn't notice very much, or maybe you would, or maybe you, your customers would notice at some point. Um, okay, so it's something to be aware of. Right, there's another um, <coughs> thing we can immediately get from this um, because with this trick, of having several patterns in individual match clauses, of course, we can easily see that we um, can express homomorphisms again, just like we did for Sparkle BGPs and as you can do for many other query languages. And this at least immediately gives you that query answering is still difficult. Yeah, So it's still hard for NP, yeah? just like every other reasonable query language, I would say. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's complete for NP. I'm not claiming an upper bound here. Of course, Cypher is more complex than this. Most likely it has many other features. It's difficult to analyze so um, because of the very um, operational nature and, and somewhat non-uniform design in some of the places. But um, at least from this basic technique, we can already see that it must be NP hard to find matches to Cypher queries. And we could show that actually in the same way that we have shown um, earlier for Sparkle using graph coloring and then one match clause per edge. Just have to have many, many match clauses. And as with Sparkle, this will give you a long query, of course. <coughs> right. So um, that's the basic cipher semantics. And now I promised you to tell you if on a final slide a few more practical things on how to work with nodes. You have already seen this in examples, but I would like to sum it up on one place. Uh, on one place. So you can have variables for node and nodes and for relationships. And then the question is, what can you do with them? Uh, because both of these are complex objects. A node can have many different pieces of data associated with it, a relationship too. And uh, so there is a need to somehow access these uh, pieces of uh, information. This was not so much the case in Sparkle where everything you would match to a variable was very simple, very atomic in a sense. 
Um, but here you, you have a, a, a requirement to access different fields. And <clears throat> so one thing which is very handy is to have this syntax here, variable name dot property key. This will, as it suggests from the syntax already, uh, give you the value for this property named with property key. Um, you would have to use backticks if there is a space in here or something like that. So there's a second syntax which does almost the same. You can also use var name and then brackets expression. This is heavily overlapping with this one and I'm not sure why we really need this first one if we have the second one. Um, the, uh, but they are slightly different in how they are evaluated. The expression can also be something that is computed. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you would have to evaluate the expression and it could be something more complicated. Um, and maybe if you just want to have a key here, you would have to write it as a string or uh, yeah, making the syntax less convenient. So this is a short convenient form and this is the one which is more powerful if you need it. <clears throat> um, there's a function ID that gives you the ID of nodes or relationships. That's what it states in the open, open cipher uh, document. It doesn't really say what IDs are. I think in practice they are integer numbers, probably longs. I'm not sure if they are longs, if, uh, if, if uh, Neo4j scales to the uh, range of data where you need a long. Um, but in most databases, they would be longs. I mean, some kind of internal identifier for your object. Um, but it doesn't really specify what's, what this thing is. Um, but it's definitely good to know it's an ID and you can compare it to the ID of other things to find out if two nodes are distinct, for example. <clears throat> And uh, there's a function keys that gives you all the property keys uh, um, in uh, that, that are found for the node or for the relationship um, as a list. Yeah, so this is a return type that you don't have in Sparkle, a, a list of things. And um, there's also a function called labels that gives you the labels of a node. That's, again, this can be a list. And uh, there's also the function uh, type that gives you the type of a relationship. This is not a list, but only one thing because there's only one type for relationships at most. There can also be none. Not sure what it returns then if there's none. I guess we can find out in the next video. So um, that's it. Um, so this last slide, mainly for you to get a bit of a feeling of how this works and you can already guess how, how typical uh, Cypher queries look. They use a lot of these um, uh, somewhat operational um, access uh, primitives to get into the data to, to, to get uh, some piece of information out and then also to, to compare it maybe or to filter by it or do things like that. Um, this you can also uh, try out in the exercise classes where we are going to look at quite a few Sparkle uh, cipher queries sorry, uh, which uh, show how uh, this works in practice and, and how queries really look. Okay, so that was uh, it for this video. I've shown you that Cypher is based on clauses, a bit like SQL, and graph patterns, a bit like Sparkle. Um, it uh, supports reachability, but not all regular expressions. And um, it uh, is not based on homomorphisms, as other query languages often are, but on something which is more like an isomorphism on edges. Um, but you can still get homomorphisms indirectly by combining um, clauses. So that's a lot already of information about the basic pattern part of uh, Cypher. Again, as I said, this is because of the difficult or more, more complex data model. Um, you just have a lot more insights of patterns. Um, next video, I'm going to show you an overview over the other features that are notable in Open Cypher. And uh, this will be comparatively quick, even though this, there are a few other features that we can still um, discuss. So thanks for watching and uh, see you next time. Bye bye.